Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 112, The Flourishing Synagogue. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And we are continuing our exploration of spiritual entrepreneurship, specifically looking at organizations that have been working with Klal over the last year to explore new approaches to creating spiritual community in new ways. Last week, we spoke with Debbie Bravo, who's created Makom NY, a new kind of synagogue adjacent type of organization. And this week, we're going to be talking to leaders of a synagogue, specifically Rodef Shalom Congregation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. While most of the folks that we're talking to in this series and in our last series have been people that are putting together startups, we thought it would be really interesting to talk to an existing synagogue that has also been captivated by some of the ideas that we've been talking about here on Judaism Unbound, and specifically that Klal has been promoting in terms of positive psychology and in terms of the goal of Judaism ultimately really being about human flourishing. When you take into account the long history of this congregation, they're more or less at the beginning of this exploration, and we thought it would be interesting to check in with them about what it's like to try to move a synagogue in this direction. One of the most famous events in the history of American Judaism actually took place at Congregation Rodef Shalom in Pittsburgh, the creation of the famous Pittsburgh Platform of Reform Judaism. In the late 19th century, a number of Reform rabbis gathered at the synagogue and put together a set of principles that defined Reform Judaism for the next 50 years that was very controversial at the time because it moved reform in a more reformist direction, in a less moderate direction. Rodef Shalom has had a lot of interesting events happen in its history. And what I found really interesting in looking at their website was that the synagogue started out as a Orthodox synagogue in the middle of the 19th century. And according to the website, at a certain point, Isaac Mayer Wise, one of the founders of Reform Judaism in America, came to visit in 1863. And the synagogue decided to become a Reform synagogue, which caused a splinter to go off and create a new Orthodox synagogue. But it's interesting that Rodef Shalom has a history of exploring new directions. So it's really quite fascinating to think about it 150 plus years later to look at what happens when a synagogue with a storied history like this explores new directions. Our guests today are Aaron Bisno, who is the rabbi of the synagogue, and Harlan Stone, who is the synagogue president. Aaron Bisno holds the Francis F. and David R. Levin Senior Rabbinic Pulpit and has been at Rodef Shalom since 2004. The synagogue has been around since 1856, and Rabbi Bisno is only the ninth senior rabbi of the synagogue, so there is an impressive longevity in terms of rabbinic leadership at the synagogue. Rabbi Bisno received his rabbinical ordination from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, the Rabbinical Training Institute of Reform Judaism, and he also received a master's degree in organizational dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania. Harlan Stone, the president of the synagogue, is a partner at a law firm in Pittsburgh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, where he chairs the municipal law group. Like Lex, he is a graduate of Brown University. He has a JD from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and is an experienced trial lawyer. He's also a longtime listener of Judaism Unbound, so we're really excited, as we always are, when one of our listeners becomes a guest. So without further ado, Aaron Bisno, Harlan Stone, welcome to Judaism Unbound. We're excited to talk about what's going on at Rodef Shalom. Thanks. Glad to be here. So... We've been talking for a while now about spiritual entrepreneurship or spiritual innovation, and it's been really interesting to us in sort of learning about the different folks that are working with these organizations to discover that it's not only startup organizations, but there are a number of what are often called legacy institutions that are also beginning to work with some of these organizations that are helping to support innovation. And I was wondering if we could just get started by understanding a little bit how you, a large synagogue with over 900 families involved, came to connect with Klal and the whole idea of taking innovation really seriously. 
So I'll jump in. I got to know Rabbi Kula for the first time over 20 years ago when I was right out of school. Uh, and then we had the opportunity to bring him to Pittsburgh for an endowed lecture at the congregation. And he began sharing this idea, which I'd heard, was hearing for the first time about the, the goal of Judaism being to help people flourish in their lives, to be better human beings. And it, it was uh, an insight into what Judaism could be about that for me really changed my thinking completely. We've had this ongoing friendship, and then we're now in our second year of formaling, uh, formalizing a relationship with Klal to, uh, to work on how to integrate positive psychology and the work that Klal is doing uh, in the innovation sphere uh, into our congregation. Well, it's interesting because when Irwin was on Judaism Unbound about a year ago, I mean, he has some tough stuff to say about legacy institutions, you know, both about their... Uh, their ongoing purpose and their ability to meet their purpose and also the obstacles that they often face in trying to make changes. And I'm wondering if uh, if he when he, when he spoke at the synagogue, if you heard him and you said, yeah, you know, he's really describing a lot of challenges that we are facing or it was really more a case where that wasn't the part that that fully registered with you, but you you were more drawn to the to the more positive stuff that he talks about, which is the aspirational opportunity for Judaism to refocus itself on positive psychology, on the idea that it's about human flourishing, and that it wasn't so much that you were hearing problems that you were facing as well, but more that you were sensing an opportunity that you hadn't been uh, taking advantage of? When Irwin was speaking about uh, legacy institutions, I had the experience of sort of recognizing or realizing that, oh my gosh, there's a vocabulary for this, right? This is the experience that we're having is not uh, completely unique. And in fact, there are dynamics that are uh, at foot or at play within legacy congregations as we try to navigate for the, uh, for the, next, for the next century. Um, I had begun uh, asking for, calling for, uh, what is referred to in the Harvard Business Review as courageous conversations, mostly about how congregations and into agencies in my, our case in Pittsburgh, but anywhere, are going to need to work together. Um, and so that my interest in this was sparked about seven years ago uh, on a structural level. What, what Rabbi Kula brought to us was what needs to happen within the congregation itself. So it wasn't just about linking arms with other organizations, other agencies, other congregations. That's important because to, to make it across the, 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 the divide from here to there, um, it's going to be necessary for us to work together. But that work had to go on within the congregation also. And, and Dan, let me say that, um, at, as I recall Irwin's lecture, which was part of a lecture series that we have at Rhoda Sholem, um, he went through a number of examples of what was going on in society, what he characterized as transformational changes in the delivery of different products. He also, toward the end, took a, a, a look around the room, which is our main sanctuary, which is a historic landmark in itself. And he pointed to the fact that we were fortunate not only to have been part of the founding of the reform movement, but that what we had inherited was not just a legacy, but tremendous resources. And he pointed out the strength that legacy institutions have and made a differentiation between the amount of resources that are available to a legacy institution, as opposed to the lack of resources that you may have to suffer with with a, uh, a startup type of entity. And as I recall, the last thing that Erwin Kula said at the end of his presentation was, shame on us, shame on us, if we don't take the resources available to us and devote it to Judaism of the future. I'd love to get a little bit just of a window into your congregation. Like what, so you're a, a large congregation in Pittsburgh, but what's so like, what, what, when you're doing this work, when you're, when you're looking to bring in the principles of Klal, of Erwin Kula, of Elon Babchuk and, and do your, what's the context in which you're doing it? But like, what, what's, what's your congregation's context? What are your, what are your members like? What distinguishes you and makes you a place where this kind of thinking can happen? One of the things that I noticed when I first joined the board, which had to be close to 20 years ago, is that uh, we are located in an area of the city, um, which is, it is the gateway to the arts, education, and the health community in Pittsburgh. And as such, 
you, we look out our windows every day and we see thousands and tens of thousands of students at Carnegie Mellon University and at the University of Pittsburgh and at uh, UPMC. And um, so we are influenced. Yes, we're a Midwestern city. Yes, we're kind of Rust Belt, but at the same time, we're all about innovation. We're a city that prides itself on experimentation, startup, and innovation. And so some of that colors the way that we look at the religious institutions in the community as well. So yes, we're, we're legacy, we're old school, we're Midwest, but at the same time, we're extremely influenced by innovation. Let me, let me add also that uh, there was a recognition when I was um, first applying for this position about 15 years ago that uh, the congregation had done stunningly well in terms of every metric by which congregations are evaluated um, for the last hundred years and more. But that uh, when, I, when I arrived, the congregation took, took a risk, not just on, on me, I was a, a, a younger rabbi at, at the time, but it had been 70 years since uh, a rabbi had come in from the outside to be the senior rabbi here. Rabbis had been succeeding one another here, which gave it great uh, continuity and, and uh, um, there, there hadn't been a lot of disruption, but in the, making the decision to, to bring someone in from the outside was a significant shift for the congregation, a recognition that we were going to have to do something different than had been done before if we were going to continue to be a leader within our community and perhaps even uh, for, the, for the country. And, and so then uh, I came in 2004, and then 2008, when the stock market crashed, it became very clear that uh, many of the assumptions upon which our congregation and similar legacy congregations, uh, maybe the Jewish community in general, had been established, were now being challenged in a completely uh, different way. We couldn't assume that we could continue doing uh, what had served us so well for so long. Uh, and so the, the, the ground was fertile for uh, introducing new ideas. As I mentioned, I, I began talking about courageous conversations, that we would need to work together. Candidly, uh, while that gained some purchase, um, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, folks jumping on that bandwagon because things were still pretty secure. So we had to wait uh, some time, continue to articulate the, the ideas that we were going to have to do things differently because everyone recognized that the changing demographics and sociology and economics of our community were such that we couldn't assume that we could continue doing what we'd always done. Uh, the community would look different uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Ultimately, while we have immediate needs and we have a generation of folks that are here now uh, who need their needs uh, addressed, the community that needs to be served, that also the responsibility we had as leaders was to anticipate what was going to be required in 20 years, 25 years, uh, and to set ourselves uh, upon that path. Um, so there was a real sense of, of embracing that. It was happening, fortunately, within Pittsburgh more generally, shifting from a steel-based industry and manufacturing to what we call EDS and MEDS. That, uh, that, the, that the economy was going to be built around different uh, uh, assumptions based because of new realities, and that the congregation, while perhaps a lagging indicator, religion, education, healthcare, was also going to have to get on that, on that bandwagon. I haven't heard of any congregation where 70 consecutive years they, they were sort of in-house. That's... They don't talk to us. Well, maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I, I'd love to hear, so you, you had this sort of, maybe subtle, maybe not so subtle mindset shift or this desire to to look to Klal and to look outside to inform new and innovative ideas. What, um, I know that we're, this is a long process and it's not all about like, have, what's, what's the thing you've already changed that you can see, you know, the, the pews are flooded and all, blah, 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 blah. Right. um, but what, what does it look like? Um, what has it looked like and what may it look like moving forward to take, some of these ideas and, you know, make them into, into practical programming opportunities or, or other kinds of shifts in your community? What, what, what has changed or could change as a result of the conversations you've had? Um, after lots of discussion uh, with a local uh, large conservative congregation to create a, a joint Jewish education program for our religious school kids, um, that took a lot of thinking and a willingness to not be as concerned about who gets the credit for what we're doing but to recognize that insofar as our charter step stipulates that we want to create a, a, an organization that will meet the Jewish educational needs of, of our young people, that how we get that done was going to be different than had been, had been the case. And we wouldn't necessarily be able to any longer be a congregation that could meet all the people, all the needs of all the people all the time, but that we could do more if we worked collaboratively. And so that was the first step. The idea of bringing flourishing in was more of a focus on what we do 
internally and how we understand what our raison d'etre is uh, in, in that realm. But it, so, Aaron, that's, that's the rabbi, though, um, you know, and, a, and a, long, a rabbi of long standing. How, how do you see the difference in practicality between um, what you were doing before and what you are or might be doing once you introduce flourishing into the mix? Like, how, how do you see very concretely that um, changing the way that your synagogue or a synagogue functions? Well, let me say this about, about flourishing first. When, when Rabbi Kula introduced this idea of, of uh, flourishing uh, as, as human beings, being what, what a congregation is really all about, uh, for the first time, two questions were answered for me simultaneously that I had never uh, quite been able to, to get together. The first question is, why be Jewish, or why should I care if my kids or grandkids are Jewish? And largely, the answer to that question, when, when you ask folks, boils down to some some combination of nostalgia, responsibility, perhaps some guilt. We don't want the lights to go out uh, on our watch, uh, but that never completely satisfied me. Um, and so the idea that the, the goal of a congregation, of a Jewish congregation in this case, is to use the wisdom of Judaism to help people flourish in their lives, then uh, answers the question, why do I care about being Jewish or why do I want my kids or grandkids to be Jewish? Because I think it'll help them be more fully human beings. That was a really satisfying answer for me. And Peter Drucker, the, the great management guru, used to ask, what business are you in? What, what, right? What's the business of the congregation? And while uh, leaders of the reform movement had said in the past, and it makes for a very nice soundbite, that congregations are about making Jews, Peter Drucker would then come back and ask, so how's business? <laughs> right? But if the, goal, if the goal is to help people flourish in their lives, then that becomes the same answer to uh, what business are you in, as in why should you care about being Jewish? And being able to link those two together was incredibly satisfying for me. And I felt like for the first time I had a, a, a clear path forward in terms of what we're, what we're all about. Um, people aren't joining congregations in the same numbers with the same expectations or, or needs as was the case 100 years ago with an immigrant community who wanted very much to be part of congregations in order to retain a sense of loyalty to our community, even as they were being um, minted as new Americans. Right, we're now fully American, and uh, we don't need the congregation to help us do that anymore. So, what role will the congregation play? Well, if we can, in a serious way, use the wisdom and traditions of Judaism to help people be more fully human beings, to flourish, to realize their their their, their innate potential—not as Jews per se, but as human beings—that's really very satisfying. One of the first things we did uh, as part of what we call our flourishing project, working with, in concert with Kalal was to begin challenging the assumptions about why we do what we do. We've gotten good at doing what we do, and we've seen diminishing numbers over the years because our congregation is aging, or, and perhaps even more importantly, because what we have been doing for so long isn't resonating in the same way with the next generation. And so the idea of focusing on flourishing, how can we help you uh, by using Jewish wisdom to be uh, more fully who you are, becomes a very compelling uh, uh, means of, of, of approaching what our, what our tasks and daily responsibilities are. So on the high holidays past, uh, this, this, this last fall, we focused on the idea of courage, uh, recognizing that because of so much change that's happening in our country, in our, in, our, in our world, with regard to expectations about what families are about and what we can expect from the world around us, focusing on courage, which is uh, a character strength that is part and parcel of what it means to be a, a fully actualized human being. We invited congregants to participate in a writing project that we called Tools for Elul, wherein they shared stories from their own experience about moments when they acted courageously, or they discovered that, uh, that, that in point of fact, in, in response to a particular circumstance, they had uh, the wherewithal and the resources within to meet those challenges. And so to lift that up, and we use that as a theme for our high holidays and invited congregants to participate in it, and it captured imagination in a new way. It didn't set the, the bar uh, in a new place so much, but it shifted our focus about what we're really trying to accomplish. So we're trying to look at every aspect of the, of the congregation, put it through the lens, the filter of, uh, of, of human flourishing. I would add to that, that part of it, part of it kind of boils down to how we present the change and how we, how we deliver the message. I remember being at uh, a biennial uh, several years ago when Rabbi Rick Jacobs gave a uh, gave as an example, if there's a, a guy standing outside of his restaurant and he's grabbing pedestrians walking by and saying, I want you to come and eat in my restaurant, and the pedestrian or the patron says, 
why should I do that? And the owner of the restaurant says, because I want to survive. I, I need the business. Well, that's not a very good invitation to bring somebody into your restaurant. And I think to some extent, that's kind of what we've been doing as well. We're not giving people a real reason. Uh, and I think, Dan, I, I know some of your feelings from listening to the podcast. But part of what we need to do is to present this in a mu- present the future in a far more positive way so that it's not like we're here, you need to join us and you need to support us because we need to survive. We're beyond that. It's you need to support us and you need to become part of this movement because it is good for you. And we have something that you're going to like, that you're going to experience in a meaningful way, not something that you're just going to be going through the motions on. And that is another part of this flourishing idea that I talk about to the board. And when I get the opportunity, I was speaking to the staff the other day. And I said, the thing that, that really you need to focus on with flourishing is, it's, an, it's really, at its, to me, at its root, it's an effort to make Judaism and the teachings of Judaism and the wisdom of Judaism useful. And instead of, instead of having a product that we just adhere to, it becomes a product that we can use in our everyday lives in a positive way. And that's where the positive psychology also comes in. I think we need to be much more aggressive in how we market and present what we're doing. I'm thinking about a question that often comes up for me in the midst of these flourishing conversations, because there's like two different motivations that one could conceivably have as a congregation or as any institution to to move towards a model of positive psychology, of flourishing, et cetera. And it's not that they're mutually exclusive of each other. You could have both motivations simultaneously. But one of the motivations is people aren't coming. And if we do this, if we offer something that's related to human flourishing and and that speaks to them in a deep way and helps them make their lives better, that they will come and that that will in turn help our congregation continue, et cetera. And I think that's often that's often sort of the talking point that is most exciting to use because it's it's a great way to convince somebody who's not on board with the flourishing idea that, oh, this will actually build something that I care about. But the other reason to do this is independent of butts and seats. It's we just think that this would be good. And, and what I'm hearing from you both um, in the passion with which you're talking about this is that it's not just at least my perception is that it's, this is not just coming from a place of we believe that by shifting our congregation to a place on that focuses on human flourishing, that then more people will come to our congregation and will last for, you know, 50 years longer than we might have otherwise. It's that this is something that the world needs and it's good. And and I worry that sometimes in like in Jewish communal conversation, maybe it's because in the, the startup world that we're often talking to, like everybody's constantly applying for grants. So we always have to spin things as as reaching more people and and succeeding in that traditional metric of, you know, number of folks being engaged by whatever the programming is. But um, I'd love to hear like basically my ultimate question is like. If you knew for if somehow you had a a future ghost of ghost of Jewish future that came to you tomorrow and said you're gonna have way fewer people participate in your congregation. I, I have no idea. This is just a hypothetical. Like way fewer people are gonna participate in your congregation, but the human flourishing is going to speak so powerfully to them, and it's going to be a, a deep core part of their lives. But your congregation is gonna be smaller. Would that be a sort of a success story or would that be a challenging thing to hear? We need to get out from uh, under the, uh, the idea that we measure success uh, exclusively in, in uh, the size of our membership roles or the size of our budget or the size of our staff. Um, the goal has never been um, for, for our congregation or for that matter for any congregation to exist for the sake of existing. We want to perpetuate ourselves in order that we'll always be here to have some kind of bragging rights or be the hegemon in the neighborhood or in the in, in the in the community. I mentioned before that as long as we don't care who gets the credit, 
uh, as long as we're not looking to uh, to beat our neighbor uh, or to look over our shoulder, worrying that the other congregation is catching up on us, but rather appreciate that our responsibility is, in our case, to the non-Orthodox or to the liberal Jewish, to the Reformed Jewish community, uh, then we will continue to perpetuate this idea that every congregation standalone needs to continue on its own. It may very well be that structurally, we need to link arms with other congregations to get the job done, uh, because the, the the essential needs uh, remain the same in every in every generation. How we get those needs met that changes, right? So it it, it it's a foregone conclusion, it seems to me, that the current community, our community here in Pittsburgh, but every community uh, around the country, will not necessarily look the same in 10, 20, 50 years as it does today. Uh, but the essential needs that an individual has in his or her lifetime, that a family requires, that parents need as they as, as, as they raise uh, the next generation, um, congregations have a significant role to play insofar as we have a wisdom and a, and a tradition to draw from. Um, but I but I don't think it's it's the goal to make sure that uh, we continue to grow bigger uh, every year. That was a long time goal. I don't think it's any longer. Um, because we just had, for instance, a, a community study here in, in Pittsburgh uh, measuring the community. And while our community in, ag in absolute numbers is growing, the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, the affiliation rate among non-Orthodox congregations is contracting, right? So it just isn't the case that we necessarily can assume that we're all going to uh, survive or that all of us are gonna be needed uh, in the same way as was once the case. And we're going to have to give up the idea that uh, our primary responsibility is to perpetuate our own organizations and focus instead on what the needs of, of, the, of the community is, what Amcha, what, what, what our people uh, are, are, are going to require, and figure out how we, how we get those needs addressed. How do you think about the possibility that one of the things that a synagogue of your size might want to do, might be able to do, is to somehow be an incubator for uh, new startup type organizations that, that might, um, rather than having to start from scratch outside of the synagogue, which is challenging, as, as you said earlier, and we all know, because they don't have resources. And so that's their biggest challenge. But the, so the question is, is there, is there some way, I guess, a, a kind of a symbiotic relationship, perhaps, that a large synagogue might be able to have with some of the folks that, that may be in the community or that perhaps you might bring to the community who um, are, operate more in that, in that sphere? And, that, and perhaps, you know, with the, with, the, with the expectation that perhaps one of those will, will flower and grow and, and ultimately become sort of a, another nucleus within the synagogue, such that we would be able to say to people, look, there's one way to be an active member of the synagogue is to go to the worship service every Shabbat. And there's another equally valid and deep and meaningful way, which doesn't involve going to the worship service at all. And, and that was actually something that I was trying to get at uh, months ago when we were talking to, to some other folks in the Reform Movement. And I was saying, like, I'm so inspired by the idea of the RAC, the Religious Action Center, the whole idea of social justice. Like, I would love for there to be a weekly Shabbat practice where I practice social justice, you know, instead of going to the worship service. You know, why isn't that offered anywhere? And, um, you know, it, it seemed like that was too radical to say that we should actually restructure the synagogue world so that it's, you know, doing a practice of social justice as an alternative to worship that, that it's offering, like that didn't seem to be something that, that was too easy to get people to sort of embrace as, as an idea. So I'm wondering, as you're sort of into this process, how do you think about, you know, where it might spin out to? So we're fortunate in Pittsburgh, and I'm sure this is true around the country, that uh, we have a number of, we'll call them startup entities, right? Uh, prayer minyanim and, and different, uh, a, a drumming circle, uh, an independent uh, uh, prayer group that gets together on a monthly basis. And just this past uh, winter, we made the determination that we wanted to help encourage uh, these or, uh, entities, not because we see them as our rivals, but actually because we see them as viable alternatives on a, on a, on a, on a, on a weekly basis or on a month, for a monthly Shabbat worship opportunity. And so we've brought them together or invited them to join us in what we're calling uh, Weeks of Jewish Flourishing that'll run between uh, the end of Passover and, and Shavuot, the official seven week period there encouraging our members to, you know, give it a try. See if you like the drumming circle or the chanting circle. See if you want to try this other uh, um, in, in independent experience that may run concurrently with the, with the services that we're going to be offering on a weekly basis because we still have that uh, responsibility and still have a, 
uh, a cadre of folks who, who really look forward to, the, to, to that, and that's their, their regular Shabbat offering. And we're not ready to do away with Shabbat and, and offer something else exclusively. But we want to encourage these other uh, uh, means of, of accessing Jewish wisdom, giving expression to, uh, to spiritual yearnings. Uh, and most importantly, we want to be in the room when those things are taking place, not because we want to put our, our thumb on the scale, or not because we want in any way to take away their their agency and their independence, but because we are, are coming to recognize that any one of these may be the future. They all may be the future. They're, they're being um, created by the, the various uh, people that, that are running them, but also are being uh, co-created by the people that are participating in them. And rather than see them as our rivals, we want to recognize that the Jewish community is trending in that direction. We don't have all the answers. We're not going to uh, be successful in our own right if we don't uh, help encourage the next generation of, uh, of Jews to express themselves in whatever way is, is meaningful to them. Um, and that ultimately is part of our responsibility as a legacy congregation in much the same way, if you will, as large congregations have long understood one of their responsibilities to be training young rabbis, an assistant or associate rabbi who then goes off and she takes over her own congregation or he goes on to do something you know, independently from the congregation. We have that responsibility to groom the next generation of rabbinic leaders over the years. So it seems to me now that we, as a congregation that has uh, a good amount of money in, in, in the bank, but as I like to say, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons are the two guys that are sitting at the end of the bar, their ties loosened, and one says to the other, sure, I make a lot of money, but you must remember I spend a great deal, right? That, that, uh, that, that, that we, we have uh, an, an enviable endowment, but we still struggle to make, make, uh, uh, make, make budget every, every year, um, and those costs continue to grow. So as, as these other uh, means of accessing Jewish wisdom and Jewish practice uh, proliferate, we want to be part of, of encouraging those because we think they're, 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 they're viable, they're, they're, they're meaningful, and ultimately that's our responsibility as a, as a legacy institution. There are far more Jews outside the congregation than inside the congregation. And um, the obligation we have isn't just to increase membership. The obligation I feel we have is to touch the rest of the Jews who are not inside the walls. We need to more and more focus on where are Jews and how do we continue to do the job of rethinking, reimagining Judaism so that it fits within the Jewish community as a whole. I would love to like. I'm I'm always in this place, and listeners are going to laugh because it's what I. It, this is one of those questions that I always ask because I've got my Milwaukee roots and I've got my small town piece of me to mid-sized city piece of me. And so, I mean, part of why I'm so thrilled to be having this conversation with y'all is that um, we featured so many voices on this show from New York, from the Bay Area, from, uh, I mean, occasionally from Chicago, I mean, from like the, the biggest of the big Jewish communities. And Whenever I have these conversations, it's not that the people we talk to aren't doing incredible things. That's why we have them on. But there's always a part of me that's like, you know, if you reach one one hundredth of one percent of the Jews of New York, of, of New York City on a, on a regular basis, you're still reaching like a few dozen people. And like and, and like it, it's like you can you can do the coolest outside the box things because there's just such a massive population but when i hear about something in pittsburgh that's thinking outside the box or something in in an even smaller jewish community that's that's really pushing boundaries i get really excited because i know that there are listeners because i've heard from them that here you know oh I, it's great that brooklyn congregation can have 37 micro communities and do cool social justice programming and all that. It's great that, you know, whatever person that we're talking to is able to do what they're doing, but like, we can't do that in our town. And I, what, what I'm hearing from, from you, it's not that Pittsburgh's tiny. I mean, Pittsburgh is also still in the grand scheme, a pretty big Jewish community, but what, but what you're getting at is that you can still start to think these ways, even in situations where you don't have, you know, a million and a half Jewish innovators, for lack of a better term, starting up, starting up projects like you do in a Chicago or in a in a New York. So all that's to say, like, 
if if you were talking to a listener who's hearing you right now and is thinking, hmm, this is cool, but they're like a 900 plus family congregation and they're still, even though Pittsburgh's not New York, in a pretty hefty Jewish community. Glad they're doing this, props to them, but like, we can't do that. Let, let, let's say it's a it's a counterpart of yours, Harlan, who's a synagogue president in in a in a town with 2000 Jews or a rabbi in in that town like what would you say to them do do you think that part of why you're able to think outside the box is the scale of your congregation or would you push and say that the principles you're talking about could be applied in in, in other mid-sized to small town contexts if you're asking me i think that that it it's it's a matter of changing the culture it's a matter of changing the way people think it's not a matter of how much money you throw at the problem. It's not about the bricks and mortar. It's about making, making fundamental changes in the way you think. It's about ideas. And ideas are cheap. I mean, it, you can sit around a room and brainstorm ways to do things. We, uh, and again, I'll go back to our collaboration with Klau. I think one of the things that has benefited us tremendously is rather than sit around the table like you say and wonder about how to do this, we actually have brought Clow in to help advise us on how can we accomplish this within our budgetary constraints? What can we do differently? Um, how can we reimagine and rethink what we do on really on, on a, on a, um, on a cost effective basis where it's not costing an arm and a leg? So when Aaron talked a minute ago about the changes we made in our high holiday services to get people to think differently, about what the job is of the high holidays of Yom Kippur. These were these were not expensive um, things that cost the congregation a lot of money. The biggest expenditure we've made has been into the consultation with Clow and with uh, having them uh, guide us, if you will, through these first two years of experimentation. But the cost of the experimentation itself has, is should not be a barrier to changing the culture or changing the way you think as a board or as a congregation. Where it was once the case that small congregations in small communities, and I grew up in a, in a small town in Georgia, uh, where there were two congregations, one reform and one conservative, and we were off the major trading routes. Um, but that's not the case in, in, in the same kind of way because of the reach of this podcast, for instance, right? Or because of the network that's created online uh, and the way wisdom and experiences are being shared within movements and among interested parties. And um, so I, I think this kind of thinking can be done anywhere by anyone, a few like-minded folks or a few people who bring intellectual curiosity and a willingness to think uh, outside the box, to think in a different way, to question the assumptions upon which congregations have, have been established, challenging what it is that the high holidays are really about, um, and there are iterative, iterative processes uh, by which we can have those those conversations and we can share uh, wisdom with one another. And that itself becomes exciting. And I'm convinced that that's another way in which we uh, we, we engage the larger community. If any congregation were to, to, to ask um, in an open-ended way, what do you want to see from your congregation? What, 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 what do you imagine the congregation of the future would be, or if you could change anything about the way in which congregations are organized, what what would you what would you take up first? Asking the question, inviting that participation, is part of the process itself. I don't think Harlan or I believe that we that either of us has the answer, but rather we're going to co-create the answer uh, and the direction we want to go with the people that are invested in that conversation, and that we're not going to necessarily complete it during uh, his presidency or, or the, the, the length of my rabbinate, but our job is to leave the congregation in a stronger position for our having served in the roles that we do, and then hand off the baton to the next person or persons who are gonna take it uh, and, and, and take it where they go. Uh, and we don't desire that that our kids or grandkids or the next generation that, that of rabbis and, and congregational presidents and uh, are necessarily gonna do Judaism the way we do Judaism but are gonna rather be invested in the, uh, in the enterprise itself. We're gonna continue asking, what job do I want my congregation to do? What job do I want Judaism to play in my life? We talked a minute ago about our, uh, our joint education program with a conservative congregation. When my kids were growing up and they had to go to Hebrew school on, on Sunday morning, 
or on Saturday uh, or Sunday school, um, they would say, you know, we hate going. We've, been, we've gone to school all week. We've been in classrooms. We don't want to sit there and, and spend another four hours listening to someone lecture us or ask us to do homework or prepare for Sunday school. We hate it. And my response at the time was, of course you hate it. I hated it. You're supposed to hate it. That, that's the whole point. That's the point of Sunday school. Everybody hates it. If you didn't hate it, you were a nerd. There was something wrong with you. All right. So, um, but out of that, and I would say that's traditional legacy thinking. Out of that, though, we created this joint program with our uh, conservative partner at Beth Sholem. And we found a educator who was extremely innovative. And as an experiment, we put the two uh, Sunday schools together. Uh, we hired this very innovative educator who, who's done a terrific job. And all of a sudden, we're now the third largest. She tells me we are the third largest uh, ed, uh, Jewish educational institution in the city, which is un was unthinkable five years ago. So all of a sudden, kids want to go to Sunday school. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime, but it's happening. And that's a microcosm to me of what can happen to Jewish congregations uh, as a whole. Um, it was an experiment that, knock on wood, absolutely has worked. And it didn't cost an arm and a leg. It just required some creative thought and some determination. I think it requires one other component, an egoless willingness to uh, focus on what the job is to get done, right? And if the job is to provide the best uh, Jewish education we can provide, how we get that done will start revealing itself if we're willing to explore what those, what those options are. In our case, it was linking arms and doing this together. And while the reform parents were concerned that it would be too conservative, the conservative parents were concerned that it would be too reform, and what would we do about whether or not the the, the kids would be required to keep kosher, or whether what we would do when we come, come together for services, and what we, whether the kids would have to wear a kippot, whether they have to wear yarmulkes. It turns out that those things just sort of fell away once we had a critical mass of students in the room and we were focused together on uh, creating the best experience we could, using the best ideas available to us, and we're focused on uh, getting the job done sans ego. So we're rounding out. And so, I mean, I'd really love to hear whatever concluding thoughts you have. But as we do, I mean, another pattern of mine is that I'm always curious about institutional names. And Rodef Shalom, I mean, for a lot of legacy congregations, we it's just, I mean, it's been around for a hundred years. We, you barely think about the name that much anymore. But Rodef Shalom is a powerful name. Um, I th Often, often ideas of pursuing peace, that's, a, it's related to, pursuing peace. That's what it means. Um, and I'm always hesitant around that translation because there's, you know, there's seek peace and pursue it. There's justice, justice, you shall pursue. And those sound so pretty, but like to me, the the Hebrew rodef, it implies a sort of like an urgency. It's like pursue isn't, it's like chase after it. And, and what I love about this conversation is that it appears to me that that name, like chasing after peace or, or chasing after the future. Chase, I mean, it, it appears that sense of urgency is there, even though, as we've said multiple times, you're not in some dire, terrible place where, you, where you're where you struggling to survive. It's that you just have an excitement for the future. So um, as we close, just uh, are there any last thoughts that you'd want to leave our listeners with about this time period for you and as, as you rethink your congregation to be continuing that, I don't know, rodefing in in the future? Let me say this. I think that uh, the sense of urgency is, is real. It's not a sense of panic, but there is a sense that uh, not making a change or not doing anything is itself a decision, right? Hope's not a strategy, but choosing to, to, to stay where you are is not a, 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 a path to success. I like to think of uh, Rodef Shalom as, I like the idea of the urgency that, that you suggest, but also that we're ever in pursuit of the ideal we want to achieve. Right? The goal isn't to, to reach some, some finish line and then declare victory, but rather insofar as we're in pursuit of something and we invite others to join with us and we join with others in order to move towards our goal line, that's the, uh, the, the ultimate raison d'etre of our congregation, to, to be pursuing uh, a sense of peace, pursuing a sense of perfection with the understanding that uh, we're ever in, uh, in, 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 in efforts to get there. 
I remember listening not long ago to an interview with Sting. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of rock. And so Sting was being interviewed and uh, he was being asked what he thought of the changes that were taking place in the music industry and wasn't it horrible and how would, uh, how would artists survive in the, in the new era? And uh, Sting's answer was, you know, music has been around for hundreds of thousands of years and music will not disappear. The business of music will need to change and we will need to adapt at how we deliver the product. But music will not disappear. And I feel that uh, Judaism and organized religion is about the same as music. It's not going to disappear. But the business and the institutionalization and the way in which institutions deliver the product will have to change with the transformations that are taking place in the rest of society. Thanks to both of you for joining us for this conversation. It's been a great one. Thank you both. Dan, Lex, appreciate being with you. And thanks, of course, also to all of you out there listening. We want to close out this episode, as we always do, by encouraging you to be in touch with us. And there are a few ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound, or our Twitter feed, at Judaism Unbound. Second, you can head to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And, of course, you can hit us up via email at dan at JudaismUnbound.com or lex at JudaismUnbound.com. The last plug we like to make is that you can always send us a donation, either on a monthly recurring basis or just a one-time gift. And you can do either of those at JudaismUnbound.com slash donate. So thanks so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>